The following program is brought to you by Knowledge Network staff who have generously donated the funds to Partners in Knowledge. Near the southern tip of Vancouver Island, BC's rugged west coast, nestled between the craggy cliffs and rocky shores that lie between Jordan River and Port Renfrew, is a picturesque paradise known as Sombrio Beach. Named in June 1790 by Sub-Lieutenant Manuel Quimper of the Spanish Navy for its dark and shady appearance, Sombrio Beach has a long history of human inhabitants. Originally used as a summer village and hunting and gathering place by the Pachadat First Nation, the beach was later settled for short periods by European and Chinese prospectors. After the completion of a logging road between Jordan River and Port Renfrew in 1957, the beach became accessible to hikers and backpackers, and a new group of settlers moved in. This is their story. Well, you can talk about your building. Hey, I ought to know. My feet's so tired, I feel slow-mo. New addition, room for a chair. Got a big picture window like a breath of fresh air. He's a real beach comer, all washed up. He just gets by. Don't ask him why. He's a rail splitter. Likes that cedar. Time to slide. It ain't no lie. Nails mostly rusty. His bender's made straight. I got a big old can of galvanized roofers. Cheap rate. Split level post and beam with notches. Look, it's fun. Throw away your watches. He's a real beach comer, all washed up. He just gets by. Don't ask him why. He's a rail splitter. Likes that cedar. High in the sky. Low I chose to live down here because uh, economically it made sense. Seaweed! Alternative lifestyle, some call it. I don't know. I, I kind of uh, I find harmony with the ocean and the moon and uh, cycles that way. And uh, my, I'm not at a fast pace. I'm not at a fast pace with the, uh, the clock. If I don't feel good one day, I can just sit in my lawn chair all day if I want. <laughs> I don't have to worry too much about uh, deadlines. First time I ever saw this beach was in 71. And just came down for a visit. Ended up near, to, up in Tofino. Yeah, it's summer down here in 1980 and then came back in 1981 and lived here ever since. Moving up to my car. I have long-term projects, fixing surfboards and, and just living day to day. I don't have uh, own own any property, but uh, I buy my food, okay, and uh, and I'm happy. I fix this one. These things are worth ten bucks each. It's when I fix them. I'm doing it for exchange for dental work. My, this belongs to my dentist, uh, Dean Stelmas Chuck. There's a plug for Dean. <laughs> well, I know I could go in and rent, I can do a rent, a, a rent a house or something in town, but it's just not my, not my bag, not my thing. And it's a healthy lifestyle out here. You're always doing something carrying kids around or wood or water or <laughs> save a lot of energy you don't have to go you really don't have to go far for food just paddle out in your canoe let go like, let go you know mussels off the rocks whatever go fishing we have mussels limpets gooseneck barnacles we have chitons uh, uh, urchins uh, the odd abalone uh, but we get the world's biggest halibut 
out here on, on our banks. We've had a decrease in lingcod since in my time here. I've been here for 17 years and our lingcod population has dropped drastically, but uh, more people, you know, you get less fish. It's a little simpler life. You're not, not as complex as living in town. I don't know, I've always, I've always lived this way. I don't know any other way. <laughs> My kids experience life on a very natural level here. They're interacting with the ocean, the ocean life, the, you know, the animals, and they see uh, birth, death, and you know, life and procreation in all its stages. They see all kinds of different things. There's a lot of positive people that come visiting too. You know, we got some good friends. We used to come down through a root trail all the way from the highway when the highway was dirt. It was a fun hike. It took about an hour, I think, to, to do it. Uh, it had been maintained a little bit by the prison that used to be at Bear Beach, a uh, minimum security prison, and they would let the guys maintain our trail. Very few people will remember that. That happened in the early 80s. Well, the original building was over here. Actually, Rivermouth Mike used to live here right before we moved in. And he had a house fire, burned everything down. Started off was about the size of this place, and then we've just added on to it over the years. Um, Barbara added on. She knows more about construction than I do. I'm just the, I'm just the basic wood carver. She knows carpentry the way I know carving. The main tool is the main one. My most important tool is to build this house was a staple gun. It uh, puts the plastic in place and then I take a knife and trim it. But the wood in this place was picked up on the beach. It's all driftwood. And I've lived by that rule of thumb not to bring any wood because there's plenty of wood here already. And, uh, you, and I collect the, the flat pieces and then you can saw the ends off and get a nice length and you're in business. It's surprising how much lumber a guy gets on this beach. You get lots of lumber washes up. That's, what, that's why you can build houses with it. That don't work. That's just a dead lighter. Very handy tool. I don't need electric bills and phone bills. We are rich. We are very uh, lucky to, to get the clean air and the clean water. The, the view. People pay for stuff like that. The beach uh, evolved into a, a community of uh, different types of people that had each had different cabins and, and, and we each acquired about 100 yards each. The cabins were all spaced by, I call chainsaw distance. Noise wouldn't bother me if my neighbor started his saw or chopped his wood and had a dog or anything that was, uh, and it was a nice distance. We each had a ranch, so to speak. We were the caretakers here. Maybe Mike's explained that to you. You know, people would say, "Oh, I'm going to build a shack right next to yours," and we would tell them, "You know, hey, this isn't uh, downtown. You know, you, there's lots of room. I just spread out. You know, that, plus it keeps things cleaner." Since the arrival of the first squatters in the late '60s, a number of interesting characters have come and gone from the beach. By the early 90s, there were a dozen or more cabins and between 20 and 30 residents. People had different reasons for living at Sombrio. From an outsider's perspective, it's easy to view this community as a bunch of freeloader hippies squatting in paradise. In fact, many of these people came to Sombrio with the same pioneering spirit that inspired an earlier generation of settlers. Well, they did accept benefits such as the child tax credit that all Canadians are entitled to, Steve and Barb strove to be self-sufficient. They produced and gathered as much of their food as possible. The six youngest of their 11 children were all born with the help of a midwife in their sprawling house on the beach. They homeschooled all their children. For 
others, living on the beach was less about the challenge to be self-sufficient and more about escaping a society they did not fit into. It was a form of therapy, a way of dealing with addiction or mental health issues. The community was an experiment in anarchy. People would give each other space and privacy or help each other out when needed. There were also lots of community potlucks and parties. There was a lot of crafty type people that were into playing music and uh, painting and drawing uh, artwork and seemed to be existing quite nicely out here. There was never any real serious problem where someone got hurt or anything. It was always uh, handled with, uh, if there was a problem, people handled it with, uh, with uh, diplomatically. It was all pretty good. And there was, ne there was very little violence. It was and a lot of fun. I feel there's a good community here, that people get along with each other, even so there's likes and dislikes, that people trying to accept and live and let live. Yeah, as long as you don't offend me, beautiful, we can live right next to each other. I don't agree with everything my neighbor says down there, yeah. but uh, we get along. I've seen destruction everywhere. Yeah. I've seen quite a bit of this world already and I've seen destruction everywhere I go. I've done part of this destruction, I feel very really guilty about it. I worked on oil rigs, I've done falling, I've done all those jobs, high money and do it fast. Yeah. And then re later on I realized I was raping for trying to make a living and I didn't feel too good about that part. Yeah. So uh, I don't really want to follow evolution that fast. Yeah, I'd rather take my time and still enjoy what's left of nature. It's a matter of a, of a, a lifestyle that you feel comfortable with, just being with nature. That's what it's more about for me, personally. A house like this I can build at any time I feel like. Yeah. But to find a spot just to be me, yeah, just to be uh, trying to get in in harmony with nature again, instead of uh, estranging myself more and more from it. I get people down here, they see a bee and they flip, yeah? They, they don't realize that this world doesn't concentrate around human beings only. There's a lot, yeah? There's bees, there's all kinds of things, yeah? And it's just natural. That's nature, what it's all about. In the winter time, the waves get big enough to clear that rock over there, Cannon Rock. And it booms and shakes all the big stones and logs on the beach. The rain comes pouring down at an angle here, and the wind blows. And it's a very powerful thing. It's a thing that uh, I like being in uh, where nature really affects you, the physical space. And, uh, I enjoy that. It's, uh, it's a creative boost. I've lived my whole life in the city and I've found that with my work it's very difficult and very frustrating to pay rent on that kind of an income and I would prefer to do the physical labor of carrying my water and my wood and, and um, not have too many personalities around me confusing my headspace too many car noises and fumes and that sort of thing. I have zucchinis, a couple of different kinds of lettuce, beets, carrots, celery, strawberries, peas, potatoes, tomatoes, onions, spinach, sunflowers, lots of different kinds of medicinal and culinary herbs. As close as you could be to heaven. Yeah, organic food is really expensive to buy, but it's really cheap to grow. When the parks came in and created Pacific Rim National Park, the community of Rec Bay scattered and some people went further north along the coast and some people came down south to Sombria Beach and a community began to grow there and 
Egypt. That's where I was born and lived there for the first few years of my life. And then I grew up in the mountains. I spent my younger years in the mountains. And when I came back to the coast, I reconnected with Sambria. I was just drawn there to my roots. My father was a carver and a fisher, and my mother was a weaver and a gatherer, and we lived very rich lives. My father would fish all summer, and we had a smokehouse, and we would dry our fish, and my mother would gather berries, and my father's craft, like I said, was carving. He carved totem poles and masks and bowls and furniture, and my mother weaved cedar bark, made bark baskets and mats. And I'm making jacadis, and they're just flour and water, and the idea is to roll them really thin and cook them at a hot, hot heat. And if you cook them at a good heat, they'll pop up just like a pita pocket, like a pita bread. One pita bread! Well, actually, she brought you. I came here because it was paradise. I was working as a chef at a little bistro in Gastown. I wasn't going anywhere in the job because I was already the boss. So and the guy wasn't gonna open up a chain of restaurants. And I came down here and spent a weekend down here and went back to Vancouver and called up this guy who buys houses and furniture and everything and sold the whole, sold it all. And I went back to work and quit quit work. I went into work, started my bread, made my bread, put my soup on and said, wait a minute, if you don't do this now, you're never gonna do this. And I walked in the office and I never quit a job like that in my life. I said to the boss, I quit. He says, what do you mean? You giving me two weeks notice? I said, no, if I don't, if I give you two weeks notice, I'm not gonna leave. I'm leaving right now. You know, I found my paradise. And that day I was, I had sold all my stuff, all the furniture in the house, everything, and packed up the, the lady and uh, moved down here. from the people here too and it's great that anybody has the opportunity to live here too you know it's a rule that if anyone's gone for longer than two months that you can move in if there's a space available and it's like someone would come in and build it the structure or whatever and then after that person's gone whoever moves in seems to like they'll do something to it and the next person like it adds so much character because we came in and you can see what Paul's done with the walls and we put in the stove and you know, we've added our piece to it, and it'd be really nice to see that continue. Well, my baby left me the other day, because I had no money for a bill to pay. That woman took a trip far away. She left me for... We got buried in August the 22nd. <laughs> on the beach? Yes. Yeah. And these are rings. <laughs> Eric on the beach made yeah. them. And Kenny on the beach... Uh, did a really good job and married us. He just read from like Cahil Gibran, uh, the prophet on marriage, and it was really beautiful. There was about 30, 40 people showed up. Yeah. I work very hard every day. I make, um, I make things out of metal and out of whatever I can get my hands on. And I can live off of 50 or $60 a month. I don't see myself as a freeloader, so uh, anyone that sees me as a freeloader hippie hasn't looked at me closely enough. <laughs> this would be um, a shawl brooch, or a shawl pin. Silver that I melted down out of my scraps. Interesting piece, not a stone. Stone that fits in it. Like that. You can do uh, all of a sudden with very little because you find contentment in other things. And the uh, commercial world doesn't affect you so 
heavy anymore in your brains. I'm 42 years old. To most people, I'm a failure. To myself, I feel I am a very rich person because I have different values. Watching TV all day, you get quite uh, discontented yeah, with all this getting thrown against you. Go and get this, go and get that. With what? Yeah, I am not uh, Rockefeller. Uh, I came here a bit too late. <laughs> BC's always been kind of a attraction for many types of people. People that kind of I can relate to. Manitoba is very different, and it's just too cold there. <laughs> I can't live in the bush in Manitoba. At this point in my life right now, I'm not that good, and be able to be comfortable. You know, this is a good. This is the best climate for that type in Canada. I got a nice, small little camping structure that has good heat in it. A little tiny tin can stove. <laughs> Something very simple and basic. The health club. Gold's Gym. We're looking for Gold's Gym around here. This will get you in shape. Get you long, young looking. The people that find Sombrio are all good people. I mean, there's no problems here. It's uh, a nice balance. Uh, it seems to attract good people. But in the summer and in the, in the warm months, you get more campers, hikers than we used to. It used to be isolated. Now it's, uh, it's accessible with a nice road. And uh, it's great for those people that like to get a backpack and take, out, take off with a picnic and, and get some exercise. What I know about the beach is that it is a healing space. A lot of people come and do a lot of growing and healing here. And I think a lot of people become enlightened here too, you know, just to feel the power of the elements. The magic of this place, right? You just get a chance to calm down. And because there's not so many distractions, you know, all around you all the time, and you get a chance to look in inwardly where the truth is because you are the truth. Primal therapy. That's why the city people come out here trying to get what we already had, but they're ruining it. What do they call it? The Gore-Tex crowd. Yeah, I'm, I got Gore-Tex on. <laughs> I'm not in the Gore-Tex crowd, but I got Gore-Tex. I got Velcro. Hikers! Cool, modern hikers. <laughs> what? No, sir, I'm just standing here on first base. Find my shoe legs. Push it forward and get hurt. We're actually uh, interpreters to these people that, uh, that come down here to get out of the city. If anyone could do this, what you have to do is learn how to make a fire and live without electricity. So I teach a course on, course on fire building. It's called River Mouth Mike's Fire Building 101. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, $130. Call your mama. You gotta watch you don't burn the house down when you're making these things. It's the foot warmer. And you come in, put that cold surf in your feeder. Ah, you just put them on that stove, warm them right up. Without electricity, you turn to books, and uh, it's interesting trading off books with other people. This is the book all the modern physicists rant and rave about all the time. I like to order it, especially. It's only been recently translated. It's thousands of years old. It's ancient. It's interesting. There's a whole world in, in books and just what's, what's, uh, what's out there this year. 
Oh, this is my first physics book. Yeah, a brief history of time by Stephen Hawking. Yeah, it took me a long time to figure this one out too. <laughs> yeah, I read Schrodinger's cat. I'm reading Jurassic Park right now. It's really good. Dinosaur, lots of lots of vision. Eight months out of the year, surfers dominate the uh, area. <laughs> and uh, But the surfers are good people too. The majority of them have jobs and they, they come out to, to escape the, the city also. But a few of us are into it so much that we like to live here. We'll go paddle out and get wet. A little exercise, loosen up. Somebody's taking off. I ain't got time to talk to you folks. See you in a bit. And the first time I, I went surfing at Sombrio Beach, I had about 10 killer whales pass me, and I it was so spiritual my first time surfing here that I, I, I just was in another world, so I thought the whales possibly lived here all the time, and I thought, well, I won't make any noise, and they swam by me. But uh, now I'll get out of the water if I see them that close. And they can be uh, frisky. Steve grew up surfing at Huntington Beach in California. He passed on his love of riding the waves to his children. Well, our whole family surfs. They grew up on the beach. Uh, you know, the waves get pretty big here, so they're... Even I'm scared sometimes to go out, eh? And I say, oh, I'm going out. He's out there. Scary sometimes, but he's, he can ride him. <laughs> okay, I'm Leah Ray Rose Johnson Oak, and I grew up on Somerville Beach. I'm 13. And I started surfing when I was seven, that's six years ago. And yeah, we usually just hang out and surf and run around and play and skip and have fun. I'm going down the trail, the trail's kind of muddy. My load is sort of heavy, but I'm with my buddies. Halfway down, I can smell the sea. I start thinking how much fun. We mostly surf right in front there, kicking. There's the other breaks, that's first. The break over there is second. At age 12, Leah placed third in the women's division of an international surfing competition in Tofino. It was the first of a series of wins. Ever in their life, oh life, was so beautiful back then. Never really thinking it would ever end Sitting around the fire all night long Singing, jamming all the old songs Telling stories about winter storms When the wind starts blowing and the trees are crashing down Like the limb through the roof Stuck into the seat that was still warm And how the years fly by Time has an ebb and flow Like the tides for the older children, surfing became their ticket for world travel. At Sombrio, they made connections with other surfers from around the world. Isaiah traveled to Mexico. Jesse traveled to Mexico, Hawaii, and Western Samoa to surf. I was like six when I started, something like that. I learned uh, pretty much on my own with the help from my stepfather and other surfers in the area who are getting into it, but it's surfing's more something that you learn on your own. You have to put in a lot of your own time into it, so it's hard for somebody to teach you without you having the desire to go learn it. I don't I think anybody ever taught him to surf. I never really learned. taught him, just he, you know? he'd take well, a probably start off with a belly board and the shore break or in front of chickens there at low tide and, it's, and it's just progress from a belly board to just probably a beat up surfboard. <laughs> We keep our eyes on him and just watch him when he was a kid. He's just 
Jesus had such natural talent. I know he was better than me when I was 22, 21. <laughs> it's amazing. I've seen him like at the first peak at Sombrio when you know nobody else would go out as too big or they'd try and go out and get washed ashore or something. They'd be hunting for the tube, he's a tube hunter. He would always look for the most pitching wave he could find, you know, and he'd walk to it if he had to walk to it. <laughs> yeah, he'd walk for miles to find a good wave. The surfboards were used for more than just entertainment. Several times, Steve and Mike used them to rescue people from sinking canoes. They rescued a fisherman who was in a canoe without outriggers or flotation that flipped in the waves and sank. They also rescued two other fishermen, caught by a sudden change of wind and weather, which swamped their canoe well offshore. Okay, here's the guy calling for help. You can see his hands. And here's me and Mike, the rescuer, the eagle guy. I was thinking of carving two surfboards on his wings. They're great uh, rescue tools. Well, we had heard rumors, oh, about 10 years ago, eh, that there was a private piece of land down here. We didn't know exactly where it was. And then, oh, I guess in 93 or so, I was out surfing and I came in and there's these surveyors and they just painted uh, green dots on this tree right here. I was figured, oh, maybe we're on that private piece of land that I heard about. It turns out it is. The triangle of land bordered by the beach and the Sombrio River that Rivermouth Mike, Steve, Barb and their children were living on was indeed private land and had originally been the site of a large placer mining operation. When the Spaniards arrived in 1790, they found gold in the Sombrio River. The first mining began in 1860, with a number of successive small mining operations on the beach. In 1907, the last major claim was made, and a larger mine operated until 1914. At its peak, there was a 50-man monitor and sluice operation with a cookhouse, blacksmith shop, and bunkhouses. R.S. Gallup, the superintendent for the mine, staked a claim on the beach property. Gallup's daughter, Jean Kinsman, inherited the land. She sold portions of it to pay the taxes, but kept a section along the river and beach. The Kinsman family, now living in Seattle, had not visited the property for 30 years and were not aware there were other people living there until 1994, when they saw a Times Colonist article about the community and the newly created park. Back in the 90s, I guess it would be, BC Parks had an interest in the land. On the, like, the whole stretch of land on the coast here from China Beach up to Botany Bay. They wanted to turn, like, a whole strip along the coast into a park, basically, so they could build another trail along there, kind of like, like an offshoot of the West Coast Trail traffic for people who want to go on like the three-day hike or something they don't want to do the whole 10-day west coast trail hike or something you know they don't want to have to make the reservations that you have to if you want to hike the west coast trail so it, it's kind of designed to serve that that sort of traffic and i guess in bc there's laws that say you're not allowed to live in a park and obviously not if you're if you don't own land there you're obviously not allowed to live there and so basically just told a bunch of people that they had to move off the beach. I don't know, I'm not in the land ownership. I think the land should be, you know, for everybody. The whole system is just too much for me to fathom. It comes down to the rich and the poor, I think. You know, the parks wants the tourists, tourists have all the money. But I guess the government figures they see a place like this and 
they go, oh, that, uh, that doesn't look right. It's not, uh, it's not a park. There's a house there. <laughs> Whereas, you know, here there's always been, for thousands of years, there's been somebody living down here, right? Eh? Now the government coming along and saying, no, you can't do that. You can't live there. You're not supposed to be here. There are no longer any squatter rights in British Columbia. Until the late 60s, under BC's homestead system, for $10, you could register a claim and set up a cabin. There is also a grandfather clause under BC's land registry system. Squatters who have spent 20 years on private land before 1975, or 60 years on crown land before 1970, have rights to that property. Neither of these situations applied to any members of the Sombrio community. They had no legal right to live there. I think a lot of people are intimidated by it because it's something that they've never seen or experienced before. You either live in the city and work a nine to five job and then you're sort of like, you're accepted by society, you know? But uh, some people it just doesn't work. <laughs> what kind of people live where there's nobody living, you know? Um, I don't identify with the word Canada, even, actually. I'm a resident of planet Earth. As an animal living on this planet, I should be able to live on this planet by the means that I provide for myself. And I'm satisfied with the basic lifestyle. So I think this is, this is the place for me to be, but... Perhaps I need to be further away from the reaches of the infrastructure. Gandhi said, live simply so others may simply live. That's a good quote for me. I'm living simple. I've chosen to leave society. <laughs> so wherever they can kick me off here, but I'm gonna go somewhere else. You know, wherever I can live in nature, so I'm at the start of my path right now, so I'm here. This is a good starting point. They came down in the middle of July and they said, we want you guys out of here by the end of September. They never gave us any written notice at that time. I personally feel that it's just intimidation at this point because they don't want to create a big scene. They don't want a lot of media attention. You know, they want to just intimidate us, get the number of people moving through for us just to like pack up and move on. There was media coverage though, and while the community received positive press, some of the commentary was not very flattering, and the message was clear. The Parks Department wanted the community gone, one way or the other. They came down, got information from everybody off the beach and then they went and reworded it and put it in certain phrases so that when it came back down to the beach everybody freaked you know they were totally consumed by their fears oh my god yeah we really are getting evicted October 1st and if we really don't leave the RCMP are really going to come down you know where am I going to go who's going to rent me a place with four dogs two cats and a rooster whose inner clock is all messed up right <laughs> Sombria Beach was really easy because it was accessible to food, to the city, and there was, you know, there was a family there, there were people that you could interact with and communicate with. I think that's the fear that people have, is like trying to find another space that's out there and sacred also, where they can be with people and share their visions. The last week or so, um, I've been considering building a float house. I think uh, that's legal squatting. Either that, or I can just truck further into the bush and live with the bears. The system's always going to try to bring those that are trying to live this lifestyle down because it totally contradicts the lifestyle that they want us to be. Like, was I born free? Or. Uh, <laughs> Was I, was I supposed to follow their way, so? To me, it's always a threat because they're trying to destroy this lifestyle I seem as uh, appropriate for human beings.
not acceptable in society to do what we're doing in the public eye. We look like we're having too much fun. Three, I believe, was the last year they logged here. And they came quite close to the edge of the beach, actually. Just the logging made quite a mess and clear cut. You know, I, I figured they were going to turn it into a park. Why didn't they turn it into a park before they logged it? Then it'd be a real park. They've got this trail advertised as, a, as wheelchair accessible. Most of the people that came off this trail this year needed a wheelchair to get off the beach. Well, it's really bad out there. My mother used to live further up the coast in uh, the early 70s on Long Beach, or which was called uh, Wreck Bay Beach. And, um, you know, they found this beautiful paradise out along the coast, along this logging road, you know, and... Um, then the parks came in and uh, evicted everyone within 48 hours. And it was, it was really horrible. They came in, they burned the shacks to the ground, they destroyed crops. And um, so yeah, it's sort of like something that I can foresee happening down here. As you know, what the government wants, the government gets. They want this as a park. They want that private piece of property that's within the park perimeter, and they'll get it. It's it's really sad. Like I'm not. I don't give up, you know. Like, but I'm not into fighting either. I'm not because it's a hard battle, you know. Like land. <laughs> People have been warring over land forever. Yeah, I'll, I'll say my piece, you know, but yeah, then I'll leave. <laughs> I don't want to create another uh, Oka here. <laughs> I was in the Marine Corps when I was 16 years old. I haven't forgot a goddamn thing. You know, I don't remember what happened last night. Apparently, I was passed out down the beach. We somewhere. saw you. <laughs> we saw you. We saw you with your dog. I'm not. I'm not uh, going anywhere. I'm dying. You know, my liver's collapsed. Uh, my skin's fallen off. I might as well die here as die somewhere. I'm not going to die in some sterile little apartment in the city without my animals. It's always this big quibbling argument about whose land it was. Technically, this is native land. The park is only borrowing it right now. It is a heritage site here, yeah. Well, the natives used this as their fi uh, fishing village in the uh, summertime. So this whole mountain here is... Without realizing it, Steve and Barb had built their house and workshop on top of middens. The Pachadat First Nation created the middens over the many years that they had a summer village at Sombrio. They provide the archaeological proof of extensive use of the beach by First Nations. You've seen rocks that are, you can tell there's, some of them are shaped and you find um, whale ribs. Sombrio Beach was uh, ancient spiritual healing grounds. They used to come to this very rock and fast and pray and wait for their spiritual visions to come to them. Well, I've talked to the native uh, administrator up in Port Renfrew and he said, basically, you have to deal with the owner, even though this, like they have a native uh, land claims here, the New Chanus said, but there's this white guy that owns the land in Seattle and he has a piece of paper saying it's his land and so you have to deal with him. Yeah. So we did, basically. And now I guess Parks is gonna end up with it. Then the natives will probably take Parks and say, no, wait a minute, that's ours and maybe Parks will <laughs> give it back to the natives for, you know, eventually. It's really hard. Watching the change of this space has been really hard for me. So the parks were coming down. The guys in the green suits and the green hats <laughs> were coming down and letting people know that the, they didn't listen to the eviction notice and didn't leave. Then there was going to be trouble. 
So they were going to get the police to come down and start removing people, and they were talking about people getting arrested, and and it was just getting messy. So, you know, it was kind of, they didn't go down the beach successively. They just sort of went from one place to another place, whoever was around at the time, and would interrogate until someone got freaked out enough to leave. They actually chainsaw the cabins in half, pushed them into themselves, dumped gasoline on them, and set them on fire. It was very intense. It was, because it was such a peaceful lifestyle. And then all of a sudden, things started to get rough, and they got really intense. Intervention by the Salvation Army prevented a confrontation and the use of force against the remaining holdouts in the community. They provided transportation off the beach, short-term storage for people's possessions, ferry fares, clothing, and help in dealing with social services. The community at Sombrio Beach came to a peaceful end and the cleanup began. Again, there was some sympathy for the squatters in the media, but the general sentiment was that they were an undesirable element. That's what you're going to see down here is, is family groups and uh, day use area, people using it day by day. Families will come back, the, the rowdies won't be here, people won't be intimidated to come down here. I helped to take it down, yeah. I mean, it was a big place. It took a while to put up, it took a while to take down. This, uh, all of a sudden, I'm sitting on three different camp spots where I used to call my home, yeah. what I used to call my home for the longest time. So. Rivermouth Mike, Steve, Barb, and their children were not forced off the beach by the Parks Department, but their days on the beach were numbered. The Kinsman family was not happy having squatters on their land, and the Parks Department wanted to buy the property. Steve and Barb started paying rent so they could stay until their youngest son, Tobias, was born. So the, the community down here was uh, out of place for the park, so they, they have to uh, get rid of the, uh, the, the population that was that accumulated here. That I can understand why they do it, you know, because they, um, it's a public place now. Basically, it seems like it's just, there's too many bureaucrats we're dealing with, eh? And politics, and we're just one little family, eh? We don't really need to be hassled. We need help, is what we need. We don't need to be hassled, we're being hassled. Well, basically, I don't have a plan, so. Well, except, okay, summertime, we're gonna put up a tent and see what happens. Look, I, want, I wouldn't mind trying to salvage some of the wood and want to get our stuff out of here. And, uh, I have no intention at this time. Uh, like I, I don't feel like hassling, like going through the court system to try to change the world, you know? Even though I, I do feel that because you're born on the planet that you have a right to living space. Like, if, we, if I got a right to life, I have a right to living space. Like, I wasn't born with dollars in my pocket, you know, I shouldn't have to chase the big buck all my life to, um, just for a place to live, you know? That's, that's one way that I feel. We made a deal with a private owner, eh? And he respected it, so we're respecting, you know, we, we made a agreement to tear down the building, so just keeping our word. And we figure, this, you know, this beach has given us 15, well, me, 20 years of happiness, whatever. And it's um, payback time, yeah. Take, tear down the house, clean it up, you know, make it look like a park. It's been a good time living here with the uh with uh, the elements, getting getting all my wood off the beach. And I have to tear it down now because the park's coming. And it's coming down slow because it's sad. So first I'll take out the kitchen and I'll take out uh, the desk and I'll move it all into my trailer and uh, mobile. Going mobile.
Steve and Barb and the kids are the best neighbors a guy could have. And uh, I feel like a, an uncle to the kids. And uh, it's been enjoyable to be their neighbor. And they've been very uh, understanding of, uh, of any, when I had a problem or something, I could talk to them. So we're like, bro, he's my bro. And uh, we surf together. And uh, he's raised his family to get down here next door to me. And I've, I've just, it's just like utopia for me. And I, I kind of, uh, it's sad to see it go, but we're, we're, we're trying to cooperate and uh, uh, go. This is going to be uh, <clears throat> kind of uh, Armageddon <laughs> after Utopia. You know, it's like we're, we're, our time is over. How do you feel about having to leave here? Uh, well, we always uh, knew that somebody might come knocking at the door. That's always been a given, but it's still hard to deal with once. The landlord visited us the other day, and he posted the property. He was out here, he thinks the beach belongs to him, and he was ranting and raving. <laughs> he thinks my house should be down, but he, he went home. And, uh, I've been here 16 years, and this is my home. He can go away. I always feel like it was my home, for sure. Yeah. I don't know what it'll be like in 10 years. But yeah, I'll feel like it's, I'll probably feel like it's home and be really happy to be back where I was raised and be able to like run around and visit all the trees that I used to go and hang out with. eventually purchased the private land, and the park has become a very successful tourist destination. There is no one living at Sombrio Beach now. The only evidence of the community is the cement and stone hearth from Stephen Barb's fireplace and a couple of memorial plaques. The former residents have scattered some continue to squat nearby or have moved to Port Renfrew, Victoria, and Salt Spring, while others have moved as far away as Ontario, Quebec, and Europe. That's a pure what ails you. I sure like coming down here and taking my shoes off and getting my feet wet in the salt water and resting my weary soul. I'm a day user just like, <clears throat> just like the sign says, when you come down here, you put your money in the blue box. No matter what changes occur, the spirit of Sombria will always remain, it will always be there. And so it is very dear to me and I visit the beach often. I enjoy being there and I enjoy reminiscing when I'm there and I enjoy that, you know, my son can come to the beach and enjoy the beauty and um, here are the stories of when his Nana used to live there and then when his mom was born there and his mom lived there, you know, when she was older on her own. This is how people normally catch me early in the morning. I made sure he got it on wheels this time, yeah, so I wasn't forced to destroy another one in a hurry. 
just uh, this way of life, uh, to be close to nature is a very healthy way of life. And uh, I believe that's why I'm still alive, because I had this experience. Yeah. I can see it from here, I can hear it. The whales are still doing the same noise. So yeah, I'm still part of this beach somehow, I feel. Yeah. I haven't left yet, that's how I feel at this moment. Yeah. After a final summer living on the beach in an army tent, Steve, Barb and their children moved to Port Renfrew, where they could still be close to the beach and good surf. It was a difficult transition. I think it was really hard on some of my kids. Like, I don't think Megan's ever going to get over it, really. She's been the one that was hurt the most by... She had to leave when she was 16, and she's having trouble adjusting. She lost her home, her culture. You know, I had to make a transition of culture because I know that living at Sombrio was like living in a third world country and taking someone out of a third world country and saying, hey, you got to go live in suburbia. Um, it's just difficult. And Port Renfrew is like a little town stuck in the woods. That's what it feels like when you're living there. At the end of 1999, Life took a devastating turn for the family. Steve's oldest son, Clearlight, died in a car accident. Within a month, Barb's oldest daughter, Dawn, was also killed in a car accident. Eleven weeks later, another vehicle accident took Jesse's life. I really wonder if Jesse and Dawn would have died if we had been living at the beach, so... I mean, it would have been a totally different day, but you can't go into ifs. It, life's not like that. Life, life is. You know, you're dealing with is, not if. That's what you got to deal with. The deaths hit Steve hard. They affected his health and sent him into a depression. As his health problems became more serious, he sought medical attention. But by then, it was too late. He had cancer, and it had spread. Steve died, and his ashes were scattered in the surf at Sombrio Beach. He had to be sick for a long time. Like, it may have just made it harder for him to think about himself, you know, when, when you're um, devastated by the loss of your children, then it's hard to do anything. Like the never-ending cycles of the tides and the surf, life goes on. Isaiah has started a family, and Barb is now a grandmother. After the suicide of a friend, Leah started a program with Barb to teach and encourage youth in Port Renfrew to surf. The Patchadat Surf Project helps break the cycle of boredom in the community. There goes Reef. Steve's spirit lives on in his children, who continue to surf and visit Sombrio Beach. Over the years we shed, as if we still don't care. I guess I, guess I have my ups and downs, but I have